What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. This week, we're reviewing the film His House, which a lot of people requested, and it got pretty good numbers on that poll I did on Twitter. Oh, yeah. When people, I asked people to pick a movie, and yeah, this came out, what, like early 2020? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, yes, it premiered in January 2020, then released in October 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, that the makes more sense. film festival thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I feel like we started hearing a lot about it. Late last year. Yeah, yeah, Okay, yep. that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so a couple things. We are running late this week because we've been having construction done on the place. Yeah. And because of COVID, everything is super partitioned off so that the people who are working here have enough space between them and then so we're, so everyone's safe but it's we couldn't go in We're the basically office. locked in our rooms yeah. until 5 and we're also recording this late at night which mm -hmm. we normally don't do either so the vibes are just weird for this one. <laughs> um I think it'll be good. This also might be a very long episode so buckle up. Why is it going to be long, hun? Aren't we just reviewing a movie? Oh, aren't we <laughs> just reviewing a movie? It's never just reviewing a movie. James. Sometimes it's just reviewing <laughs> yeah, a it's movie. True. Sometimes it is. But so his house <laughs> is about uh, a couple of Sudanese refugees and I just thought, well, in Britain, in, yes, who who go to yeah Britain, and I thought I kind of want to get a better handle on the politics and just the events leading up to what makes them go to Britain. I, I'm sure there's something to unpack there if you learn that history, and yeah, learning it has really made the movie itself so much more interesting and there's so much more to analyze. But I, I, in doing this, I realized, man, I know next to nothing about African politics and history. It, like even just learning American history, there's so much. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such a shame that often, like I think in, I think most people, Africa in general is the part of the world they know the least about. For sure. And, it's the, the dark continent, it, yeah, as it was called. Yeah. Which is um, also kind of racist. Yeah. I don't know if that was uh, necessarily. It's probably. <laughs> that sounds like a, what a super British. Like, That's like colonialism. Race. Yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah, racist, yeah. racist as fuck. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's just such a fucking shame. I, I in, in learning and in, in trying to research this, it took me so much longer than I, I thought because it's. It's like when you start learning about a, a country, especially that you don't know anything about, it's so intertwined with all the other countries around it and their politics and all just everything. It just it all starts to just, you know, it's a domino effect. And that whole part of the world, it's like it's so complex and interesting. And I don't know, it just it just kind of bummed me out the way that like we just that whole part of the world, we have just such a vague idea of like it's it's. Poor and I think it's violent I, and I think in general in American history classes you learn a bit about Egypt yeah. especially in relation to Israel mm -hmm. and then uh, some South, South Africa. Africa stuff yeah the places where there's a lot of like and we learned a lot about um, King Leopold's uh, oh colonization Belgium? of the Congo yeah. I did not learn it about sucks. that but um, it does suck if you want to read a really school, depressing book that. read King Leopold's Ghost but also it's really fucked up that um to kind of gain access to that kind of history in school and learning about it in school. I, I had to be in an AP class to learn. Oh, for sure. About that area of the world. Like, that's so fucked mm -hmm. that you, in essence, have to be smart enough to be rewarded with. Here, you can learn about this other part of the world that's beyond the basic level mm -hmm. of, yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm going on too long for how long this is going to be. But <laughs> uh, I, it's not, like, it's it's a coincidence this was happening during Black History Month. I didn't plan for this. I oh, just yeah. picked this movie. And I, I realized it's a, 
good chance to just rant a little bit about how bullshit it is that we just we just this whole part of the world we're like yeah it's uh yeah africa africa the continent the con- yeah. 54 countries in and it. all the different <laughs> there's so many different cultures and religions and even just aesthetics like that that was a cool thing about black panther is the design team on that kind of used that like you know just the differences that you find in style and um, you know, depending on what the environment is, it's, you know, you're out your clothing and different color palettes and stuff are all going to be different. Anyway, I, I saw a bunch of people on Twitter saying that they missed research episodes. Well, here you go. This is this is a research episode now. Yeah, it, we've it, done this before. We've accidental reviewed movies research episodes, with yeah. uh, kind of like dovetailed into yeah, research like, episodes. Yeah, like host. Yeah, exactly. Um, or the host, rather. So I want to talk about the, the lead up of... The history, politics, et cetera, that lead to our two main characters of his house to go to Britain. Because I think it informs so much of this movie and so much subtext. And all the reviews I I, I found of this movie kind of grapple with their their journey in Britain and their their experience as specifically refugees, which I mean, that is what the movie is. But Mm -hmm. I, I think there's so much more to be read into what their lives were were like before they left and how that informs the trauma that they they deal with in the movie and how complicated that is because ultimately we learn that their journey here is really morally complicated. There's yeah. some weird um you you realize your main characters are not as um purely good as maybe you would assume for the and, and what that even means to be a good person in the context of this kind of life and this kind of you know where you're forced into this kind of situation so anyway all right but we have to start we're gonna start back in 1882 james this okay is, that's not too far back it's not too again i could have i could have gone <laughs> sure. further but i african had to, history is, is I long had and to deep. make yeah. i had to make choices and ultimately using kind of britain's um relationship with the area mm-hmm Helped me narrow down what history well, talked. That's about. what the film's about. Exactly, too, so and I think the yes, and that's the interesting for. part of it too is learning about how Britain affected the Sudan and therefore affected these people's lives before they ever ended up in Britain is very interesting. So. Yeah, and as such an American viewer, it wasn't until Matt Smith popped up that I my assumption was, oh, refugees, oh, they're they coming to America. America, and it's like Matt Smith pops up and is like, oh no, no, they're, they're I, in the UK. I mean. Refugees from Africa, it's it's a constant, like, you know, you can't, like, feel like you, you always hear in the news in the beginning of the film is refugees trying to cross the English Channel. Mm-hmm. So many people drown yeah. uh, trying to go that route. It's extremely dangerous. I, yeah, I think they opened with that on purpose because that's such a common way that people die who are trying to escape. So, 1882, Britain invades Egypt. We have to talk about Egypt for a second. There's a nationalist revolution brewing in Egypt, and that would make the area hostile to foreign powers, and Britain doesn't want that because they want to have a foothold there. They want to have a foothold everywhere. The sun will never set on the (laughs) British Empire, so they say. And so they invade to prevent any other European power from taking advantage of that possible turbulence like France. And actually the British can't hold Egypt unless they also can hold the Nile River and make sure that it remains untouched because it's it's just the lifeblood of the area. And they're not worried about any other African states doing so because it's Britain, they'll be able to defeat any other, they, it's just not comparable tech or resources, but other European countries do. Again, France is the big uh, concern, I think. So Britain negotiates with Italy and Germany, and they agree to stay away, but France says no. And also, get out of Egypt, Britain, fuck off. But the British aren't going anywhere, so the French start plotting ways to get them out, which they basically come up with this scheme to dam the Nile River, which is insane. (laughs) Like, that's so crazy. And they they were going to dam it in what is now Koda, K-O-D-O-K. Also, I'm going to try my hardest to pronounce. And it sucks because even when you Google some of these things and try to find how to pronounce them, you you can't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You just can't. Uh, But that area is now South Sudan where they were going to build this dam. And so, yeah. Um, Remember back in like the 1500s when the French and English just like fought in France and England and they just had competitions over like who can build the fanciest tent? (laughs) Good times. (laughs) Uh, So the British 
they freak out because they realize they're not going to be able to hold the Nile. And ultimately, the only way they're going to be able to protect the Nile is to conquer the Sudan so that they can protect that area of the Nile also. So the France, or so the French can't dam it or anyone else. Uh, so the British conquer Sudan in the Battle of Omdurman in 1898. And there's an agreement in 1899 that declares that the French can't expand east past the Nile watershed. So, okay, cool, we've got the French out of there, but oops, now Britain has this entire fucking country that they conquered and now have to take care of. Like, they don't wanna just give it to Egypt, even though Egypt has a really good right to it because they helped fight the French. And they were a big part in that and they're their northern neighbor. Uh, but they, so Britain decides, okay, we're gonna establish the Anglo-Egyptian condominium where they govern the Sudan together. Oh, this is not a condo that you live in. No, it's, no, it's okay. a co-dominion kind oh, of you know, condominium. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, we're gonna govern the Sudan together, except no, it's Britain. It's Britain ruling, you know, Egypt is assistant to the regional manager kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Or the the, uh, the Tony Visconti to the Brian Eno. Of, of <laughs> That's a Great deep Britain. hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny to us. It's, yeah. it's cool. <laughs> but yeah, so Britain, like they conquered Egypt. So it's just Britain all, all up in this. And they're letting Egypt help, I think, to keep them happy, you mm -hmm. know. So the first governor general, and I didn't have to talk as much about these guys, but there's a lot of really funny British names in this that I had to include. <laughs> we have our first governor general of the Sudan is British. His name is Lord Kitchener. Okay. But uh, it, th that position is quickly handed over to his former aide, Sir Reginald Wingate, who actually does an okay job governing. And he had, I think he had a better handle of the, the culture and actually tried to give a shit about the country he was leading. And he he trusts the Sudanese to kind of almost rule themselves. And they um, they slowly but steadily kind of start to modernize the area. They establish cotton as an industry there, which to this day is their economic mainstay. It's like their number Sudan. one. Sudan? Yes, Sudan, okay. yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, I, I think like now the Republic of Sudan, it's their economic backbone is cotton. I'm not sure about Southern Sudan, but get South that. Sudan, yeah. Yeah, the South Sudan. You also start getting schools established, which the British are not excited about because an illiterate population is easier to control and easier to placate. And this new generation of educated Sudanese who the British don't like, they openly dislike them, they start to turn to Egyptian nationalists because they start having their own, for it's a budding Sudanese nationalism. And so they start to, you know, pair up with the Egyptians who are also being ruled by the British to kind of, you know, get some support. And that's when we start getting this 20th century version of Sudanese nationalism that's going to become very, very important. In 1924, the White Flag League is formed and their goal is to drive the British from the Sudan. And the British governor general gets assassinated in 1924. Is and it Sir Reggie? I don't believe that is Sir Reginald. It might be like Lee, I think Lee Stack was another guy. There's a lot of them and they all have very silly names. But that guy gets assassinated and the British realize, yeah, we can't have the Sudanese and the Egyptians being friends anymore. So they they force Egypt to withdraw from the Sudan. They're no longer a condominium. And in the process, they violently suppress a Sudanese battalion that's mutinying in support of the Egyptians. So during this time, you have this educated elite of Sudanese, mostly Northern Sudanese. We'll get into that later, but they form the Graduates General Congress, which is an association of educated Sudanese. And they're rightfully pissed that Britain and Egypt aren't consulting them before making major negotiations or decisions like the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty in 1936 that allows Egyptian officials to return back to the Sudan after Britain had like pulled them out. And now they're like, now Britain and Egypt become friends again. And Egypt just comes back to the Sudan without the Sudanese being consulted at all. So this group, this Graduates General Congress demands that the Sudanese government lets their organization be the voice and face of Sudanese nationalism. And the Sudanese government says no. And remember the Sudanese government at this point is 
British people. It's mm -hmm. Lord so and so, a <laughs> very British person here. Uh, they say no, and this organization of Sudanese splits into two groups. You have this moderate majority that accepts the government's decision, and you have a radical minority that rejects it. And the British know that even though it's a minority, this kind of nationalism has a really strong hold over these elite Sudanese. And they introduce this advisory council to give the Sudanese more power over governance to kind of keep them happy. You know, it's the same idea of like, here, we'll have this Anglo-Egyptian condominium where we totally rule together. This advisory council, though, where we're giving the Sudanese more power over their own governance, it is only for Northern Sudan. And uh, the British are actually purposely prioritizing that the North front over the South, and they're keeping that divide really strong for reasons that, you know, we'll talk more about that later, but this divide between North and South, even before the British, you have it, it, it like the Northern region, primarily Muslim, uh, the culture belief system is very different from the South who actually are, are mostly Christian because they're missionaries. Yes, there yeah. were so many missionaries. So you have like, a you know, predominantly Christian South. And then you have these uh, traditional religions also. It's mm. lots of pastoral oh, tribes, okay. which that's who the, the Dinka who are our main characters are speaking mm -hmm. Dinka. They're yeah, pastoral tribe, the biggest. They're one of three huge tribes in the southern region. OK. Yeah, exactly. They actually like when we get to this era of rebellion and kind of north versus south, the Dinka are like the primary fighting force making up the south. Versus. And you mean uh, the most recent, like the independence uh, split from yes. like 2011? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The advisory council now is made up of the governor general, who is still a Monty Python <laughs> British guy, and 28 Sudanese men. And hey, James, really quick, we're going to play the first and last episode of our new favorite game show, is this a governor general of the Sudan or a Monty Python character? <laughs> do, 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 do. Quick, John Loder Maffey. Uh, governor. Yes. George Stewart Symes. Uh, Python. Nope, governor. Okay. Gervais Brooke Hamster. Uh, governor. No, Monty Python character. Okay. Hubert Gervois Huddleston. Oh, that's Python. No, that's a Lord Governor of the it. Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver St. John Mollusk. Governor. Nope, Monty Python character. <laughs> See, I'm getting them all wrong. <laughs> you did good. That's no, I didn't. <laughs> hey, I want to talk to you this week about our sponsor, Shudder. Our, our friends at Shudder, the Netflix of horror, I would say. Many would say. If you want, you can stream all kinds of horror movies, thrillers, etc. for $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. So we've talked a lot this episode about all kinds of really bad stuff that Britain has done. But also Britain um, has sometimes done cool stuff. Like namely, a bunch of British people made a horror movie called Host that is on Shudder and is one of the scariest movies I've seen ever. So if you want to try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use the promo code DEADMEAT30. And that's Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com. Use the promo code DEADMEAT30. Shudder free for 30 days. Sudanese nationalists want this advisory council to also include the southern Sudan, but the British, again, they've been able to control Sudan by keeping the northern, predominantly Arabic Muslim Sudan separate from the their traditional or predominantly Christian southern Sudan. And eventually, Britain has to let southern Sudan have representation in this council. This happens in 1947. Um, because it's just too, they can't, it's it's getting to be too, like Britain knows they're losing their foothold here. It's it's too much of a force for, you know. There's also some other stuff going there's on. A lot, there's a lot, there's some other <laughs> shit going, exactly. Um, there, there's only so much I could touch on, but yeah, like think about the years that this is all happening. They've got some other shit on their hands. So Britain lets Egypt know that now it wants to prepare the Sudan for self-government. They just want, they want out of there and Egypt is pissed because they they do want Britain out, but they all they don't want to lose the Sudan. They still want to have you know like 
some power there. Um, but eventually in 1952, there's the Egyptian revolution, which mm-hmm. I can't, TLDR, <laughs> Egypt, uh, the monarchy is abolished in 53 and the new government, um, along with a bunch of other shit, but this new government realizes the only way to, okay, yeah, get Britain out of the Sudan. Like we also have to get out of there. It's either both of us stay or both of us now, go. Now at this point, is Sudan a country? Or is it a region of another, like, it's not part of Egypt. Well, or right now. Is it a colony? Is it's it a, a condominium. Country? So February 12th, 1953, Egypt and Britain grant self-government for Sudan. I think okay. now it so is now Sudan. It is. It's not the Sudan, which is this like condominium okay, of yeah, yeah. Egypt. and Britain. Again, I could be wrong yeah, here. We but might be wrong. That's my understanding. <laughs> I literally learned all of this this week. <laughs> this is my, my history class presentation. Thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, so there's a there's an election for a representative parliament, of course, parliament, and the British are backing one party and Egypt backs another. Uh, and the, the party that Egypt backed, who they ran on uniting Sudan with Egypt, they won. But ultimately, because and I just have complicated shit here in parentheses, <laughs> their leader and now prime minister Ismail Al Azari. He backs away from that promise. So he ran on like, we're going to totally, we're going to unite with Egypt. Like we're going to become part of Egypt. Yes, but once he was prime minister, he backed away from that. And he declared Sudan an independent republic with an elected parliament in 1956. So now I believe it is the Republic of Sudan, which it still is. Like it is the Republic of Sudan and Southern Sudan are two separate countries. Wait, Southern Sudan is a separate country at this point? No, 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 no. But okay. I'm saying like today. Oh, yes, today. Yeah. South Sudan, if, in case anyone listening doesn't know, is the world's newest country. Yes, 2011 is the world's newest because country. Because it, it was around 2011 when I was learning all the countries <laughs> and their capitals. And then South Sudan came along and was like, got to learn one yeah. more. Yeah. I was like, it's all our, right, It's buddy. our most baby country. <laughs> it's also the poorest country in the world, Dude, I think. Man, it. we're going to get to some yeah. shit, but it ranks... Pretty consistently lowest on like the, you know, I forget who does the lists of like world, mm-hmm. like happiness, like standards of living. All it is, I mean, it's, it's, that's a bummer. It's really, but we're, we're going to understand why when we start untangling this mess of history, it's, there's reasons. It's like, you know, and, and it's, it, you can't just fix it. You so, uh, Republic of Sudan is formed, 56 is like an independent country? I think country. it's, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. We, so, my dad's older 56 than now, it's declared an, an independent republic with an elected parliament. Okay. Uh, but this kind of Western parliament or and liberal democracy doesn't work <laughs> in Sudan because it's just this kind of weak, framework plopped on top of like all this already pre-existing like politics personal relationships loyalty conflicts like it, it you can't just be like here's this new strike it'd be like if if we just all of a sudden in the u.s someone was like oh but we're doing government this totally different way now that you've never tried before here rearrange all of your shit we would it be impossible to do mm-hmm. and that's what happens here uh and and people grow to become really disillusioned with this attempt at liberal democracy. Um, parliament just becomes this this chill zone for really wealthy po- like politicians and people who are corrupt. And it's just a way to, to like get rich and help your buddies out pretty much, which huh, isn't that isn't it always. <laughs> but now, yeah, so the Sudanese are, are fed up with this liberal democracy. So what happens when people Get sick of liberal democracy? Uh, 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 military coup. Yeah, authoritarianism. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, 1958 commander in chief of the Sudanese army general. Oh, that 58? That was fast. Was, dude. Jesus. The history of this country is just every couple of years. <laughs> Great. It's, it's wild. Uh, commander in chief of the Sudanese army general Ibrahim Aboud carries out a bloodless coup. Political parties are dissolved. But assemblies are now prohibited. Supreme a Supreme Council of the Armed Forces is formed, and at first it's kind of okay. Like they they end up selling a ton of Sudanese cotton, which they had a, a giant reserve of because when it was a liberal democracy, they basically had it at this fixed price and stuff. It's getting into economics, and I, I can't. But they ba- the, this new 
uh, military governments like, no, we're just going to sell all of it and build up our national reserve and actually have money to do stuff with, which makes sense. In 1959, they also reach an agreement with Egypt where Egypt appears to be cool with this independent Sudan. So great. Um, let's keep up this feeling of, of national unity. Egypt's our friend now and they, they want us to be independent. So Oh, Egypt is primarily Muslim. Okay, let's let's implement policy that promotes the spread of, of Islam and Arabic language. And we'll only have Northern Sudanese in positions of power because they're predominantly Muslim and it's a, it'll be a good show of faith chart. Do you see where this, we're just, you know, we gotta keep Egypt cool because they're gonna let us do our own thing. And so we wanna keep them happy. So we're just gonna put these Northern Sudanese in charge who are more like them mm -hmm. and it'll keep everything real cool and friendly. Yeah, any any education system that's uh, left over from English Christian missionaries, it's now Arabic Islamic curriculum uh, and bye-bye Christian missionaries, you go home now. So South Sudan, which again, majority Christian is obviously not happy. And there's a giant strike that occurs in Southern schools in 1962. So you have a lot of students flee the country. 63, there's a rebellion led by a Southern Sudanese guerrilla organization called the Anya Na, which they act based on the idea that only violent resistance is going to make the government actually give a shit about them and listen to them. Because if you don't put up any kind of resistance, they'll just keep steamrolling you like mm -hmm. if there's no reason or, or threat or any you know if there's no threat of punishment why would they stop their bad behavior essentially um but they still don't give a fuck and it just makes them push back harder so um north and south solidly divided because of this and 1964 there's mass demonstrations against the government's actions in the south and general aboud resigns so basically the government after this, because it's just already, it's such a shit show, like, and there's so many factors leading up to the shit show. It's like, you can't govern it. Like, it's impossible to govern. You just can't. Like, there's just so much shit going on. It, you, you know what I mean? It's like, no one could step in and govern well. Around this time, we have a Sudanese Communist Party that goes underground because their leader's killed. They attempt a failed coup in 71, 1971, I should clarify. And this prompts their uh, then leader, Jafar Mohammed El Nimeri, who is, I think, the prime minister at this point is the title of like the leader of Sudan. He establishes the Sudanese Socialist Union, which is his party, as the country's only political party to kind of stifle this dissent. And he also names himself officially president of Sudan. So in 1972, the Addis Ababa Agreement allows for Southern autonomy and separate legislature in the South. So the President Namiri says, OK, we're going to have here's this agreement. We're going to let the South, you know, basically run their own shit. They're going to be their own region. They'll have their own little like, you know, their own kind of government. And oh, wow. yeah. OK, great. At this point, it looks like there's now not going to be a civil war because, you know, he granted the southern region some sort of autonomy. So now we can use this money for other stuff. We have a ton of money. We can just invest in in cool stuff. Um, oh, hey, the Persian Gulf wants to give us money. They have oil money now Oh, because it's, you know, we're getting into the 70s and oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. OPEC. We, yep. We got some we got some oil money. Great. Oh, the IMF. The International Monetary Fund. They're going to lend us money, too. Um, here's a lesson to take away if you take away anything. Are, are you a small country listening to this podcast? <laughs> Don't ever take money from the IMF. Oh, no, the IMF do. The IMF, it's a UN agency. Do you, are you familiar with IMF and how it functions? I know that there were scandals uh, around 10 years ago or so, many, right? Oh, many, I mean, like big many ones scandals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're this UN agency. Basically, their whole thing is it's like, I don't know, the most fucking flowery, like, just language of like, it's to promote com international commerce and blah, blah, blah. But it, in reality, that manifests in things like what happens here where the IMF is like, hey, let's develop uh, economic blah, blah. I don't know. I'm not an economist. I don't know the <laughs> language. Let's in, we're going to invest money in you, Sudan, because it seems like now you've got some, you know, you're coming up on the world stage. Here you go. You got to eventually uh, pay us back, though. Uh, but here, we'll give you a ton of money. Um, oh, but yeah, Sudan now has to afford loan payments to the IMF. Mm. Better start tightening belts and... Uh, 
implementing austerity measures mm. and uh oh uh, we got all these loans piling up oh shit keep cutting the budget oh no people are dying oh no it's almost like it's just colonialism again but we don't talk about that it's <laughs> cool we still do colonialism it's just different anyway <laughs> but that's what happens is like the imf will lend money to countries that like they can't pay it back it's like they get these loans and like what so often happens with a loan, you, you get, you know, there's interest and you can't afford to pay it back. And then, but in the case where it's a country, if you can't afford to pay back a loan to the IMF, you're going to be cutting budgets where it affects people. You're cutting public services, you're cutting like basics, uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, and, and people die because of this. And, and this happens to countries all around the world. It's something that the IMF constantly gets shit for. Uh, but hey, guess what, James? What? In 2011, Christine Lagarde was the first woman to be elected head of the IMF. Oh. It is not only historic that a woman is running global monetary policy, it has been transformational to have Christine Lagarde as head of the IMF. Oh, fuck. Uh, cut. <laughs> Sorry, this is just such a fucking, like, I just was in such a fucking, like, hole after this. It's it's just so miserable. God damn. Uh, so cut to Sudan now is just in this cycle of debt and inflation that there's this constantly decreasing standard of living, rising oil prices. And we have our oil crisis. If you remember our Texas Chainsaw Massacre episode, oil prices shoot through the roof in the 70s. And that affects Sudan's budget for projects at home, along with these loans that they can't afford to pay. The government Planning for these projects is all over the place and super decentralized. Uh, lots of great opportunities for corrupt people if you're into making money that way. Um, Sudan even starts experiencing brain drain, particularly to the Persian Gulf. So all of their their nations, you know, educated citizens start leaving. Going like Yemen and I guess probably more like UAE. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, all these all these oil rich countries mm -hmm. that are, have this booming, you know, this oil boom and they have money to spend and yeah, people leave to go there. And now also speaking of the Middle East, we've got our resurgence of Islam. Uh big events like the Iranian Revolution, we've got Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic Republic of Iran and now Muslim fundamentalists see a chance to gain some power in Sudan. So remember, the government before the 60s was primarily Muslim. Mm -hmm. That northern uh, Muslim majority had all of the ruling power in that area. So the Islamist party, the National Islamic Front, works with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is founded in Egypt. And they're able to start recruiting from the country's youth starting in the mid 60s in the midst of all this shit because there's just no there's no opportunity. Like I said, there's people just leaving because there's nothing there for them. And so that's an environment where you're so much more easily able to recruit young people who otherwise don't see a future for themselves. And maybe there's no other choice. Um, and, and by the 80s now, when these kids are adults, the National Islamic Front is embedded in all these civil service jobs. Like they made, they had, they are like firmly part of the, the, um, administrative side of Sudan and a lot of them become uh, secondary school. It's just it's just a part of Sudan's culture. Yeah. Now. Um, President Namiri takes note of this because he um, his political party is very unpopular. The South Sudan hates him, obviously, because they're the ones getting the most fucked right now. Um, the centrists in government also don't like him. Basically, no one really <laughs> likes him. So he turns to the Muslim Brotherhood because they're like the only people he needs allies and they're the only people who are going to ally with him. So he appoints National Islamic Front Party leader Hassan al-Turabi. Again, he is, if you have a vague, like, knowledge of the politics of this time and area he might sound familiar to. He's appointed attorney general and Tarabi wants Sharia law. So, yeah. Womp womp. Yeah, that is never great. <laughs> Namiri, again, you know, they're the only people who are going to be friends with Namiri. So, all right, he's going to modify the laws. 1983, uh, they are now, he aligns laws uh, with Islamic law. And remember, Southern Sudan, still part of Sudan, they mm -hmm. are still one country. They are super Christian, and they also have the, all these other traditional religions as well. And oh, also no more Addis Ababa agreement. I don't know if you remember that, where we were like, 
hey, Southern Sudan, you know, we'll leave you alone. You yeah, can be autonomy. Yeah, no, no more of that. So now the civil war is basically back on. Like we st- we stifled it for a bit, but now it's it's back on. Um, Southerners take up arms under the Sudanese People's Liberation Army, a, the political branch of which is the Sudan Sudan People's Liberation Movement. A large percentage of these Sudanese are Dinka. So this is when we start getting the Dinka as this like fighting political force in opposition to the North. They are a huge part of the the schism between North and South and ultimately the South's separation from the North. And the Dink are, again, one of these three um, main tribes in that area. I have all my sources in the descriptions. There's some articles that, like, right now I'm going to read basically verbatim, but I I have listed all of my sources in here so you can check out what I'm reading from. Uh, But yeah, in the early 1980s, the Sudan People's Liberation Army, they're going to be the SPLA from now on. It's kind of a mouthful. They, um, They recruited and began, they trained boys as young as 12 to fight in its battle for independence from Sudan. And that's where this gets really complicated. And because you at this point, learning that you're rooting for the South, right? Like learning this history, you I mean, it it all sucks. History is all complicated. Exactly. Exactly. But you just you know, if you if you're going to pick a side, you're like, oh, the South, they're getting fucked. uh, People you want a good guy. Self-autonomous. Yeah. People should be able to control. And you also want. Right. And it's like having kind of a it's tempting to fall into the trap of good versus bad in in global conflict like this. Mm -hmm. And it's tempting to look at leading up to this like, oh, well, obviously the South is the quote unquote good guys here. But it's sounds like we got some child soldiers coming up. Right. And I think that's a big part of his house, too, is Mm -hmm. that what is good and, and what choices do we have to make when we're forced into positions like this? This is why I wanted to learn about this, because I think things like the the SPLA recruiting child soldiers is such a I, th- I think we see that in the movie with the use of a child as kind of a sacrifice for other people to ultimately have a, a better life and, mm. and how complicated that is and and the use of that as a reveal and how it makes us feel about these main characters that we're like oh they're the good they're the good guys right but it's comp people are complicated you know so it's they're these child soldiers were called the red army and according to a 1994 human rights watch report some of the yeah some of the children fought alongside the spla so yeah um i i think the the use of like the child as a figure in this movie is very purposeful considering that history especially considering like you know in in the movie his house this couple essentially uses a child to gain their independence you know to move elsewhere to start a new life for themselves to pave the way to a better future and 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 here it's also like you know it, it it feels like what else could the south do like of course they they should have you know have autonomy for themselves and and choice in their their life and their their governance and it's just so fucking dire that it ends up like they're using children to do so it's it, i think it's such a parallel i, I That's think an it's, interesting analogy yeah mm-hmm. for sure i think it's very purposeful especially because the the army of children are called the red army and red is such an important color in the movie uh i i was t- when i was taking notes i just kept keeping track of all the times the color red popped up because it's so specific and like it's so pointed and by the end you even have uh uh real say i think i'm gonna paint this room red Mm -hmm. it's such an and i think you know this is part of the reason why is it represents sacrifice and this is a very specific sacrifice that has been made here um so namiri tries to stop this by force uh, at first but this only it adversely just affects the citizens of like he's not attacking he's attacking this SPLA but in doing so he's disrupting the the distribution of food there and they also we've got bad harvest drought it's just a, like it's widespread famine in this region Nimiri is overthrown in, in another bloodless coup um political instability i have to skip a little bit in my notes i'm like just skip this like there's just so much um these years of uncertainty make way for this revolutionary command council for national salvation led by one of our i feel like modern days great um 
villains, uh, General Omar Hassan Ahmad Al Bashir. Oh, okay. Who are you thinking? Gaddafi. No, not. Or, okay. I mean, him and Gaddafi, though. I feel like similar, um, similar guys. Sure. The you know just except one of them still alive, Bashir. Bashir is still alive. Actually, he so his trial right now. Um, he. It's ongoing. I think he actually, like, so soon he's going to be, like, appearing in international court and shit. Sudanese military officer who was the seventh president of Sudan from 89 to 2019 when he was deposed. Yeah, 2019. Died, 2019. Does it say when his, like, when the next um thing is coming up? Uh, uh, I'm sure on, ele- on February 11th, 2020, oh, so we the just... Sudanese government announced that it had agreed to hand him over to the ICC for trial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's crazy. He's so warrants were issued. I'm skip. This is skipping for, but warrants were issued by the International Criminal Court. So ICC uh, for his arrest. First time the ICC ever issued a warrant for a sitting head of state. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> He is in trouble. For what? Uh, what was it? Oh, that was Darfur. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Darfur, too. Yeah. Just in case you didn't. Yeah, don't worry. It's going to get worse. So, yeah, Al-Bashir and his party, they're the political minority. It's just they were able to, like, take advantage of all this chaos. Uh, and they found themselves in power. Um, but since they're this minority, they have to tamp down hard on dissent because they're just they just got lucky. I, I'm not again. I this is I'm like I had to skip some stuff. It mm. was just it was just a lot. So they they imprison hundreds of political opponents. They ban unions, ban other political parties. No freedom of the press. Uh, they eliminate essentially the judicial branch of government, and now they move to punish the uprising in the south. And they reintroduce Islamic law. I think it, it yeah, because there was that coup. So it, whatever. So now Islamic law is back, baby. <laughs> um, and they side with Iraq and the Persian Gulf War. So we're in the like nineties here, mm-hmm. um, late eighties, early nineties, and so now. It's, Sudan just is isolating themselves, not only from the West, but also from a ton of Arab countries, too, uh, except Libya, like we were just talking about, Qatami. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Libya is like, you know, we're cool. <laughs> um, so the economy continues to free fall, again, because they've isolated themselves from like all this oil money and shit, too. The isolation just makes it worse. You've got civil war, shortages of basic necessities at this point. Um, and in 1991, the Boer massacre happens, B O R, and about two thousand Dinka, who again, that's our our main characters. They're, I think, I'm gonna get into that. They might they speak. They Dinka. speak. Yes, yes, exactly. So we're I'm, we're gonna get there. But uh, two thousand Dinka are killed by mostly Noor fighters from SPLA Nasir. So so Noor is another. So there's those three big tribes I mentioned. Mm-hmm. The so. Nur N U E R, I believe I'm pronouncing this correct. They watched a video. Okay. Who knows? Um, writers could have it fucked up, so who knows? Um, the Dinka and the Nur, like beyond any conflict going on and you know, caused by Britain fucking around here or Egypt or any of that, like they are these pastoral tribes that they've had conflicts over land and stuff, you know, they're just these neighboring pastoral tribes, but nothing like you know, like this, they've had conflicts like, you know, many tribes. It's it's nothing like international incident type fucking shit until this. This is like a monumental, like unheard of level of violence in between these tribes. And the reason that this happens is the government, you know, they know that there's this historical um, animosity between these two groups, the Dinka and the Noor. And so the government um, takes advantage of this offshoot of mostly newer fighters who are in this group called SPLA Nasir. Their flag, their symbol primarily, it's a giant red flag. It's like a primarily red flag. There's, I, for, I don't I forget what the symbol is, but again, we have like this red, you know, I just, anytime that that comes up here, I, I kind of made note of it. It's these very important incidents. Um, so yeah, the government uses the splinter party to, they turn them against the SPLA and the Dinka, and they're able to manipulate those previous animosities and destroy this attempt at unity between tribes to fight for. Is the Sudanese government? 
Yes. Okay. This is yeah. like Bashir, Bashir and them yeah. being like, hey, you guys actually hate each other. Don't fight for independence. You should actually like go go kill them because remember how much they hate you. And so the newer kill 2000, about 2000 Dinka and this boar massacre. So yeah, the SPLA holds a bunch of towns still in the south. I think, I think Bashir at this point holds like the main capitals, but all these little towns and different areas like the, the Dinkas still have. It's like a... Um, like the government can't fight them on their own turf, as we see many times throughout history. You know, it's like easier said than done kind of thing if you're trying to fight people on their native turf. So yeah, the government can't defeat them. Again, primarily the Dinka causing them trouble at this point. They were able to kind of co-opt the Nur's um, anger. Uh, the Dinka, though, are like the ones that are their main enemy here. And so they sent in uh, an Arab militia to just go wipe out this SPLA, which, again, in particular, this ethnic group, the Dinka, are, are involved. And the Sudanese government, they also ignore food shortages. They won't let the West come in anymore to provide humanitarian aid. One of the things I believe he is on trial for, mm. um, just blocking all international aid. Um, Southerners begin to flee to the north or go to Ethiopia. Many starve to death or die in camps. Bashir, officially elected president in 1996. He, so up till then, he, it was like an, a military Ad, like he wasn't elected, mm -hmm. you know, but now he's elected in 96. Is and it like elected he, though? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he wins a bunch more times actually. And he puts a new constitution in place in 98 and in 1999, 1999 multi-party politics are introduced. Um, but if you're feeling skeptical, you'd be right. <laughs> so authoritarian rule still continues. Uh, there is a comprehensive peace agreement. The CPA signed in 2005. And so, OK, we've got new constitution, wealth distribution. They do give a separate admin again for South Sudan with a promise of eventual southern independence. They, they say, I think it's 2005, and they say in six years you'll get to vote for independence, which is why in 2011 they become a, oh. they were able to vote to become independent. 99% of people voted to uh, become independent. 99% of people. Just of voted South to Sudanese? Yes. OK. Cool. We at least have this peace agreement in 2005 between North and South. But in 2000, so 2003, back up a tiny bit, we've got Darfur. Mm -hmm. So like we said earlier, that name, if you were around in the 2000s, you associate this region with violence and poverty, like just a jet, like a very vague sense of like it's bad there, but you don't really know why you just mm -hmm. knew it was bad. I know I, I probably signed some things on campus as a totally. freshman to like you save give Darfur. Money, yeah. You probably see the, the sad commercials on TV and mm -hmm. it's all very vague. What's the coolest type of charity to get into at the moment? Um, same with Save Dafar. Save what? Save we Dafar. Oh, Save Angelina Dafar, Angelina Jolie. Yeah. Is that in like Iraq or something like that? Yeah, that's in the, it's in, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is there anywhere in the world that no celebrity has tried to fix? Star 4 is the big one now. Yeah, no, it is. What's the new one? What's Star 5? The reason I mentioned Star 4 um, is because many Dinka who fled during this conflict we had been discussing up to this point, they ended up in Star 4 because Star 4 prior to 2003-ish was a safe place to go. Okay. Um, if you're involved in this conflict between North and South. So we have a ton of Dinka who flee to Darfur. And then in 2003, there's a rebel insurrection protesting the West treatment by the government. And the Dinka get wrapped up in that too. They just, just by happenstance, because they had to flee their homes, get wrapped up in yet another essentially like a civil a civil war um, here's a here's a fun one uh darfur was an independent sultanate for several hundred years until it was incorporated into sudan by anglo-egyptian forces in 1916 yeah, there you go there you go yeah it's cool it's cool like realizing how much that stuff and that's why i started in the 1800s domino effect mm -hmm. to this it's it's truly remarkable and really really depressing again to to deal with this the government sends in an, another arab militia and this is the arab militia you might recognize this name known as the janjaweed the janjaweed militia 
I feel like that was a, you heard that a lot in the 2000s is mm. the name of this militia sent in. But, you know, they're sent in to fight the rebels, but like they, they end up just terrorizing the citizens themselves and again, prevent international aid, etc. And yeah, there's ceasefire in 2004. But by 2007, hundreds of thousands are dead, two million people, over two million people displaced. And yeah, the Dinka are a people who now are affected by both of these huge, huge conflicts. They fled one and ended up being affected by the other. And I also think just that kind of like that double hitter of like cultural trauma, when you look at his house, there's like a lot of duality and stuff like there's like i feel like like things in pairs is a thing in the movie and we'll, we'll talk about it later when we actually talk about the fucking movie but <laughs> this is interesting just about that kind of region at this time this is from an article i found apparently so it says the the dinka here in darfur changed some of their customs they started wearing darfur's omnipresent dress a white flowing hibala or it's j a l l a b a h Jays, you never know. Are they? Do you pronounce it? Or are they silent? <laughs> uh, that's a it's a robe and a turban that sets off their dark skinned faces like a curl of white icing. Which <laughs> that's oh, I like that. But um, <laughs> it's interesting because Rial in this movie she wears lots of flowing robes, and yeah. that's not traditional Dinka. Um, that's more for my yes. That's Darfur. more yeah. This kind of northern or western, um, more Muslim influenced. Which is interesting uh, because if the Dinka adapted that and then uh, in his house they, they come to, to Britain and she is resistant to adapting the British ways. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I'm so curious like what, um, where they are actually even from because mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they are Dinka. I like they speak Dinka. That's our closed caption say they speak. And I think that they say by name uh, maybe I'm not sure if they say they're Dinka or not. I remember seeing it in the captions, like in Dinka. Yeah, yeah, but it's just interesting because when I was looking at like you know traditional Dinka like dress, and it, it looks totally different than what we see them wearing. It actually looks much more close to what the little girl is wearing the hmm. the Nyagak, the the daughter, um, and she actually I theorize that she is. Nur, uh, that other tribe, and I'll get into why I think that's the case later. Dinka people wear it's lots of bead beadwork. They like minimal clothing. Um, I think robes like like long flowing. Like I saw some pictures where it's like when they're herding cattle because again they're like a pastoral tribe. They have like the robes on, and hmm. they actually they have a long tradition of of corsetry. They make these beautiful corsets that I. I was like, man, this is bitten now. It's like we're getting barely relevant to like the the movie that we need to talk about. <laughs> but I couldn't stop because I, if you if you know me, you know that I sew and I I love doing embroidery and, and beadwork and stuff. And man, I just got really. Into, I was looking at these beautiful um this, these corsets. Where did this design come from? Was it the early nineteenth centuries century travelers coming up the River Nile? Maybe the wife of Sir Samuel Baker, who was highly fashionable and had an incredible wasp waist? Or were they the people inspiring the Dinka? Or were the Dinka, in turn, actually inspiring the early travelers with their incredible beaded corsets that really shaped their extraordinary physiques? Actually, if you're familiar with the, the Lion King musical at all, <laughs> which I love the Lion King musical, if you look at the costumes, a lot of the characters wear these really tightly fitted corsets that come up to a point in the back. I looked it up. It's inspired by Dinka corsetry. They mm. they come up to this like point in the back and they're very cool looking. So if you've ever looked at those costumes and wondered like where that comes from, because it's such a specific choice, mm -hmm. that's where that comes from is that shape and silhouette. And anyway, that's my tangent. This is why <laughs> this is going to be five hours long. But you know, it just, I don't know. I just got in like such a fucking... Like just stuff like that, where there's this really neat history of like this this tradition of of this specific garment and like what it means and the work that goes into beating them and providing the structure for them and like I, I don't know I just think of how much we we are we just get wiped out by by shit like this in parts of the world like this that um, most people don't even know 
is happening and we just assume that like it's you know just this fucking vortex of poverty and and nothing but it's just it's like the the I, w I was reading about the like theory of like it's like headphone cords that get tangled you know how, like headphone cords always feel like they get tangled and it's because like math wise there's like Statist there's like more ways that your your cords gonna get tangled than there are ways where they would like remain untangled if you put them in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So like over time, your headphones are always gonna get tangled, and it's the same thing with just like stuff like events. Like there's statistically more ways for something to go wrong than there is to go right. And this history is such that like it is just the headphone cords, to t it's just like, and, and once you have like something go wrong, then it's harder to have something go right when you've had a bunch of, you know, it just is hard, you keep getting knots, to, it's gonna be harder to untangle it the longer it goes on. Yeah. And statistically, it's just, it's just gonna, it's not gonna, you know, like it's, it's next to impossible to just untangle it all. It's just all like events piling on top of each other. And it, it's just, I don't know. I, there's such a stereotype where people y you often hear like, well, they can't, you know, these countries can't even take care of themselves. It's like people just have such a disregard for, you know, like we, this this history. It's just all these fucking dominoes. It's all just such like, you know, like so much happens that ultimately you get to a point where it's like, like, what can you what can you do? It doesn't say anything about the people there right now like you, you can't just fix that shit it's, yeah it's, you can't you don't get to just start with a clean slate right they're they're living in this part of the world with all with this fucking the tangled ass headphone cord and it i don't i don't know i just got in like such a fucking mood about it mm -hmm. especially then learning about these really cool aspects of of particularly dinka culture like their naming conventions the way they name their children is like based on like cows, like because they're pastoral and mm -hmm. their 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 color, their like names for colors are super defined by the colors that you see in like cows and cattle, like different shades of red and browns and and blacks and whites, and hmm. so you have children who are named like Rial. That name in Dinka, if this is you know if that's where they got it from. I guess it, it is the name of someone, I think it's like where the, their parents would have had a cow, like a prize cattle where it was of all white. Um, and that's where her name, that's what Rial means is like your parents, it's like your parents social standing, you have this cow that's like white. Oh, I imagine that's almost similar to, you know, having your last name be based on your occupation. Like Cooper or Baker or, yeah, yeah it's very, yes, it's very, very similar. Um, let me see, it's a, here, this is the quote from this article I have, and all my sources are in the description, but um, almost the whole extensive color vocabulary of the Dinka is one of cattle colors, and the Dinka's very perception of color, light, and shade in the world around them is inextricably connected with the recognition of color configuration in their cattle. I even thought of the color palette of the movie. I, I took note that the, like, the colors, like when they first move into their house, the colors of the walls are this kind of like muted red. There's lots of earth tones and cows are taken care of by some family members and they live in cattle camps. Nearly all young boys spend part of their childhood in a cattle camp. People are often named after the cows that are used for the marriage of their parents. Cows are named after their colors, some colors, and therefore some names are more common than others. Examples are Mary Marial, which is a bull with black and white colors, where the sides of the cows are white. The female name is Rial. Oh. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, that's cool. That's where her name would have come from. Did you look up meaning of Rial, or did you just so happen to come across that information? I actually, I, I looked up um, Dinka, like the, the meaning of the color red, at first with Dinka and then I found the stuff about cattle. And then when I was looking at the art, I saw like Rial, I was like, oh, oh okay, shit, okay. Cool. And then I, I think bull I found just by Googling like the, you know, Dinka name meanings. Um, the thing that I, I think is interesting and why I think the little girl might not be Dinka, but in fact, Noor, this other tribe mm -hmm. is because her name is Nyagok. Mm -hmm. The 
the prefix nya, N-Y-A, all girls who are nur, they, their names begin with N-Y-A. And oh. it means da- it's daughter of. So it's the daughter of blank. And I, I think, you know, it, the nur, it, again, they're this rival tribe. But an interesting thing is that I think anthropologists believe that they were originally Dinka. Like they are an offshoot. Mm-hmm. And so, which is a, a kind of an interesting layer to like that conflict. And yeah. it's also an interesting choice then where you have this prefix of like daughter of, like even in her, this kid's name, it, yeah, she is not their child. Exactly. That's interesting. Isn't that like, I'm so glad that I, I went and found this stuff because that's such a neat like even just them saying her name, they're saying out loud that she is not their child. Yeah. And if you know what you're looking for, which most people watching this are not going to know, them, but if course, you knew, yeah. you would realize, like, that's not their kid. And I, I, I think that that's so... But that that choice and the fact that apparently in, in this newer naming tradition, all female names begin with NYA makes me think that not only is she not their daughter, she might be from this other tribe that they historically have had these conflicts with. Yeah. And which adds again to that, like, you know, the complex nature of what it ultimately took for this couple to have another shot. I I think with stories like this, you kind of risk the, and and I think this is what his house does purposely, is like you risk the temptation, like I said earlier, where it's like you want to pick a good guy and you want like, you want to root for the the South. Like you, you know, you it's just like instinct to want there to be good and bad in the world and, and to have the easy choice of between good and bad. And I think... With stories like this, where you have this refugee couple, you run the risk of almost like infantilizing characters like this and people like this. Where on one hand, it's it's you know it's easy to to watch a movie like this and and there's racist characters. They face racism in Britain, and obviously the movie is a commentary on that too. Is the treatment of of a refugee in a country like Britain, and it's easy to if if you're someone watching this who you, you watch it and think like, oh, I would I wouldn't be like that. I think these are clearly they're good, you know, good people, and they you know it's easy to want to just believe that they. It's almost like the no not noble savage. It's not quite that, but it's this like. Yeah, like infantilization of like, you know, just like innocent refugees. Yeah, like it it just kind of I think it's it's a little condescending, right? It's it's mm-hmm. like in a, in another way you're also denying them a big part of their humanity the by the complexities. Of yes, person, by denying yeah. the fact that they are people and they're are complex circumstances leading up to the choices they've had to make. It's, they're not like this kind of romantic, like, I, I, you know, we romantic, maybe that's what I mean. It's like we romanticize the, these people and, and those kinds of stories. And I think that also goes hand in hand with the idea of like, just this vague idea of like, Africa is so poor and, you know, I'm gonna go there over the summer and help build a house. And it's just, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like this very romantic, like simple version of what's actually happening. And where it's like, these people are still people. And I I do ultimately think these characters, they're good characters. Like, I think they are, you know, I think that's the point of the film is that they are, you, you feel for them and you want them to have that second chance and, um. But it's like, and and by the end, they also recognize that like, it like was a really f- like fucking, we have to accept that the things that allowed us to, to have this second chance are complicated and we, you know, have made us re-examine like, who are we even? Or like, are we good? Do I think I'm a good person? I don't know. And mm-hmm. um, so I think the movie is really also wants us to recognize that kind of complexity um and i think maybe i I do think maybe it is intentional and who knows that the kid is also from this other you know yeah okay so yeah speaking of that conflict between dinka and and noor now we're getting to 
close to present day uh, 2011 there's that vote um now south sudan is its own country new um, country yeah also we got warrants for al-bashir everything's coming up south sudan <laughs> right yeah the actual split itself doesn't go smoothly the the Abye region which is like basically on the border between north and south is disputed uh, the situation there is really dire um Again, the uh, the Abye is a traditional homeland of one of the sub tribes of the Dinka, the Nga and N G O K. I tried to find how to pronounce it, could not, because um, it also I think is a word in Vietnamese mm. or has similarities with Vietnamese word structure. Sure, and- yeah. I couldn't, yeah, anyway, so, and thousands are displaced there, again, the Dinka, there's, like, this subgroup of Dinka that are, like, (laughs) fucking, again, just at, like, the worst fucking crossroads of just this series of historical events. Um, That region, actually, still to this day is split in half and belongs to both North and South. Oh. Yeah. So, if you go to the Wikipedia for the Abye region, it's listed as being in both. Wow. Yeah. So... Um, but so now we're now we get up to and I think this is like the big thing that makes our main characters leave 2013. Um, so so South Sudan has a president and vice president. The president is D- uh, Dinka Salvakir and the vice president is Noor uh, Rik Mashar. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Salvakir, uh, the Dinka president, dismisses the vice president, Rik Mashar, just shit leading up to that. Basically, like just that dismissal then is just this catalyst for mass violence. Um, because previously, again, like you had this Noor Dinka alliance that. So then they got their own country and now they're having conflict. Right. Within the new country. And there was an attempt at unity. We have our president and vice president, but he, you know, it's this dismissal ultimately coming after like some conflict between these two guys. Um, It it just sets off, yeah, a a, a civil war. It's the the South Sudanese civil war, which like just ended in February 2020. Oh, shit. Yeah. You know, now in the aftermath of the, the Sudanese civil war, now it's like, Hey, wait a minute! You guys, the the newer weren't supportive enough of the the South Sudanese uh, effort because you have incidents like the Boer massacre where mm. a bunch of newer are turned against Dinka, and sure. so it's like there's just all this past shit that they have to deal with. Um, the yeah, the the vice president. I guess there's allegations that he was organizing a coup against him. The the dismissed VP. Um, supports this armed opposition of Noor rebels and he's there he becomes their leader just blood like there's years of bloodshed it's um it's fucking bad like mm-hmm. i don't even know how else to to summarize it it's just like you know it's like now it's just two sides of this extremely poor country it, like it's yeah, and that goes until February 2020. There's a peace agreement. Um, but it, I mean, there's still like it's it's still. Yeah. But yeah, so that brings us to present day. Um, I would go more into like I, I, I wanted to, to start going more into the South Sudanese war, too, because that's like obviously really important, I think, is why I think that's got to be why the characters in the movie flee. Um And again, why I think I suspect that maybe if our two main characters are couple are Dinka, that the child is newer because it also represents this conflict between these two tribes and is like another layer to what's going on in the movie. But um I yeah, I had to stop myself going down the the research hole. Yeah. It was a lot. Like it was so much more than I expected. And I honestly I did like in a I don't want to say like, oh I really enjoyed myself because it's fucking awful to read about, but it just I, I don't know. I just like kept going down these avenues of like, oh man, I know nothing about this, and f- finding it so fascinating and simultaneously extremely infuriating, and um, just realizing how little I knew about this part of the world and how little I know, like most of us know. And it's like, it's not anyone's specific fault except like. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just the way that we are taught. We're taught to view things through a very Western lens. And, you know, so stuff like this, it just feels like, oh, it's just over 
you know, so it just feels so far and like not relevant, but mm -hmm. it's it just does such a, a disservice to, you know, yeah, like people who are like these main characters where we just, you know, if, if we review something like this, I think it's kind of it's a sh it would be a shame to be like these characters lives begin and their their story begins when they get to Britain, when they come to us, kind of, right? Like, you know, okay, oh, once they end up in the, the Western world, we can explore their story from there and analyze it from there. But I, I think to not go back and track, like, well, what would have been these characters' lives before that? I mm -hmm. think you're ignoring a lot of what they're dealing with in the movie. It's, they're not just dealing with, shit in Britain like it's they're dealing with the being haunted by their their very complicated past that's the whole point and I think if you just ignore what that past was and the movie doesn't hold your hand about it um no, in yeah. terms of its politics and it's just again you just get the sense of like it's vi it's a violent area you know region of Africa and that's about it um and I, I'm not saying that in a bad way it's just it's not spoon feeding you some of the only analysis I've seen of this movie kind of just starts at Britain. Like it's like when they get there and it's their experiences being refugees. And I think the whole point of the movie is they are so informed by their experience leading up to them being refugees. And I think people kind of ignore that part. Yeah. 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 So um, we're going to make this two episodes. <laughs> yeah, we didn't count on it. It's but late I think as it, hell. I think it definitely calls for it. But uh, I mean, this is a prime example of why the podcast is so awesome and such a good part of Dead Meat. Because, you know, it, it, I, I do intend this year uh, on the Kill Count to cover movies from from other cultures, other countries. One of the reasons I've been hesitant is because I don't have this background information. And, you know, when I do those kill counts, I will learn a cursory thing to be able to just inform myself. But there's no way I can ever give this kind of information that I think will result in a much richer experience watching this movie. We could have just watched this movie like we did a, a week and a half ago and sat down and reviewed it as a film it, it is very well made. Yeah, we like I have, a ton of, I have a ton of notes and, you yeah. know. Could, yeah, the acting, the cinematography, we could talk about all that and we will. But I think it is obviously uh, the, the film, the characters, the plot heavily informed by this history that we were unaware of before. And now that we know it, the movie is so much richer for it. It's and a lot more interesting. It's 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 amazing to me. Oh, and thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to talk about this movie with that fuller knowledge because I enjoyed it as a movie. But now I really that's I mean that's why I went a little uh, a little ham just kind of <laughs> just researching and I just I really enjoyed the movie and and in my just basic enjoyment of it I was like well there's probably a lot more here. And I, you, you know me, the podcast exists because I wanted to, you know, Th this is analyze it's, it's movies. For, yeah. And I'm like, but I can't analyze this more if I learn all this <laughs> other stuff. And yeah, that's and what obviously, <laughs> like this knowledge, uh, I'm not familiar with the filmmakers or their background if they are Sudanese or just interestingly. Uh, it's so it's based on a story written by two white British people, which I think is oh. very. That's we'll talk about, which I think is interesting. But the director Remy Weeks is. Because like I saw the the lead actors are British Niger they're British uh, of Nigerian background I believe or Nigerian yeah. descent. Yeah, Remy the director Remy Weeks is also British. Um, he's black. I I saw he's also a film. Did he start as an editor? That's interesting. Hmm. Shout out to fellow editors. In any case, whether it's a personal experience or not, yeah. obviously the thought of everything we've been discussing today, everything that you've been discussing today, uh goes into this film. Yeah, and I and I wonder because, you know, knowing that like it wasn't made like I don't know if anyone who who made this has any personal ties to Dinka people mm -hmm. or like I just wonder how much, you know, if I if I start reading into stuff, is that there? Like is is are we going that deep while we're making this? I don't know. I don't know what the um, that's the thing is in, in doing a lot of my, my research on the history, I realized right before recording, I was like, I don't actually know fucking shit about how they made this movie, <laughs> 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 which is also why I think it's a good idea to make this two episodes. 
episodes. (laughs) I want to learn more about Remy Weeks. I I couldn't find a ton about him in my very cursory search, but... In any case, I am happy to have uh, been taught some history. Like I said, I love history. And I, I think know, that I love uh, history so much. Yeah, as 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 infuriating and sad as it can be, I think it's really important to know, and it just kind of opens up the world while also making it smaller uh, in a way that you just like understand. I don't know. I love it, and I'm I'm very grateful to have had you do all this research and uh, condense it down for me in an hour. And I'm sure that all of our viewers and listeners are equally grateful. I I hope yeah I hope people are okay having a week of this basically not be about film yeah it's not <laughs> like film not it's not, like horror. not horror it's, it's just, just history film. we're just doing history it, it, it's valuable context for the movie that we'll be discussing yeah, our on first next week's episode i guess for a movie i think for a movie yeah i think so which is pretty wild yeah, yeah. so that's cool but this also gives you a chance if you haven't watched the movie yet to check oh, it out go watch it it's really it, definitely it's watch very it unique but now maybe uh if you have listened to this before watching it you'll have a because i don't think we spoil we spoiled a bit we, but we spoiled a pretty big um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> a reveal that genuinely took me aback and took my enjoyment of the movie from this is very good to like oh, oh this for is sure really something yeah. special yeah i guess we'll be talking about that in more detail next week mm-hmm. uh all right well the, you know what's coming next week so uh in the meantime you can follow <laughs> dead Meat on social media at dead Meat james on twitter and instagram i'm at carebeck c-a-r-e-b-e-c-c on twitter and instagram uh there's also a dead Meat subreddit by the way r slash dead meat mm. is it dead meat or dead Meat james I don't know. Mm, oops. Uh, look it up, though. It's cool. It's on, where's, yeah, it's on Reddit. Don't yeah. talk shit. I'm a mod. I'll find you. Yeah, she'll fucking ban you. Yeah. And uh, email deadmeatmovies. No, I'm sorry. Deadmeatpod at gmail.com with feedback and such and such. We'll be back next week to discuss the film, His House. <laughs> the actual <laughs> film. This was a prank. We just said we were covering a movie. You just sat through gotcha. a history lesson. We did it. Gotcha. Spaghetti. Nice. Um, <laughs> All right, until then, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. This has been the Dead Me History Podcast. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs>